Hello and welcome to Camden, Arkansas First United Methodist Church. I'm Ellen Horseman and this is our Sunday School class. Now we're going to continue in a book that we began last week by a Reverend Scott Sauls called Irresistible Faith, Becoming the Kind of Christian that the World Can't Resist. I want to tell you this week I was driving along and my public radio station wasn't coming in, so I put my radio on scan. And it came upon a radio station and I stopped it so I could listen. And honest to goodness, I listened to that for, I don't know, 15 minutes or more. And I never could decide if I was listening to a political talk, political talk radio station, or to a religious talk radio station. In other words, which one was it? Uh, there was a lot of talk about Christianity, but politics as well. I think that it was a religious talk station, but the people that were doing the talking and talking about Christianity and talking about Christ kept making political statements, include, including disparaging one uh, political party that they didn't agree with and pretty much implying that all, all the people in that other political party were a bunch of demons. <laughs> well, to me, it's a good reminder of how too often we bring the politics of the world and the political divisions and, and wrangling in, in the world into our churches. Just this week, I happened to be in conversation with a lady who is a pastor in the American Baptist Church, and she said that she thought that was part of what was causing so many divisions within congregations and within denominations is that we've brought too much of the political into our church life. So does that mean that we don't have any responsibility? Well, yes, we do have responsibilities as citizens, but you know, we, we need to consider how do we remain good citizens in our country? How do we take responsibility uh, for the decisions that our government makes or that our civic organizations make, how do we ensure that there is real justice for all of God's people? Uh, racial justice and, and uh, justice in the court of law, economic justice, environmental justice, real justice for God's people. How do we do all that and yet not bring politics, or maybe I should say political divisions into church. How do we become irresistible Christians? Because I'm going to tell you, until we get rid of those divisions, we're not going to be irresistible to the world. We're not going to be drawing the world to us like the early Christians did. As chapter, So how do we do that? And how do we begin to focus on being what God created us to be? Well, as chapter one of Reverend Saul's book said, we have to learn to, to, to become okay with not being okay. Now, let me stop right there for a minute while I'm talking about Pastor Saul's book and, and tell you that if you listened to this last week, I promised I was going to go on to chapter two this week, but I'm not going to. I got a little bit bogged down in my regular uh, in-class, or I should say in-person Sunday school class, and then it seems that this week I did a little bit of that procrastinating and being lazy that I had confessed to last week. And then when I had a situation come up that I wasn't expecting, I found I can't get done. But I wanted to elaborate a little bit more on how we learn to be okay with not being okay. What Scott Sauls is saying is that we're not uh, the people that we should be. We we're not perfect. We're not all together, uh, but we have to learn that it's okay to be that way. That statement about being okay with not being okay, to me, kind of gets at the heart of, of one of the many problems that uh, are, are what, let me say that again, it gets to the heart at what causes a lot of problems, and I might say some downright devilment, that plagues us now and has plagued Christianity and our churches, and, and even us as individuals. And that is that we have a hard time accepting sometimes, I think, that we are saved by grace. 
we are saved by grace uh, and yet why do if we're if we believe we're saved by grace why do we feel so much guilt and shame i've always kind of scratched my head at a fellow denomination where many of its members have insisted on telling me once saved always saved and yet those people seem more uh filled with guilt and a sense of shame than anybody I've ever seen. And I keep thinking, well, if you feel like you've been saved and you're once saved, always saved, then why are you so tied up in knots? Well, maybe it's because we sometimes just have a hard time believing in God's grace, believing that we are saved and set free because that's not what we do in the world. We don't forgive people. We don't ignore what they've done to us but we were saved we were saved by grace and yet sometimes we want to feel ashamed but think of it this way if we are saved by the blood of jesus here's another question what were we saved for what did jesus intend uh to be our way of life i'm going to read something i feel like i'm uh babbling is that the right word let me read to you from Galatians chapter 5, if I can get myself there. Yeah, uh, these are verses 16 through 18. Paul says, I say, be guided by the Spirit, and you won't carry out your selfish desires. A, person, a person's selfish desires are set against the Spirit, and the Spirit is set against one's selfish desires. They are opposed to each other. So you shouldn't do whatever you want to do. But if you are being led by the Spirit, you aren't under the law. I want to say that again. You aren't under the law. Our relationship, what that means to me when it says you're not under the law, because mind you, it doesn't mean you're not under the law so you can do whatever you darn well please. I'm starting to say a bad word there. Hmm. It doesn't mean that you don't need to try to be loving and good. As a matter of fact, Paul had just said, let me see if I can find it again, uh, not to be led by our selfish desires. But he says, um, you aren't under the law. If you are being led by the Spirit, you aren't under the law. I think what he means there is that he, he's trying to stress to us that our salvation, our relationship with Jesus Christ, our relationship with God the Father does not depend on what we do. I'm going to read to you something that Reverend Sauls says about this on page 13 of his book. Let me get there. He says, you are not under the law. Wonderfully and profoundly, this statement declares that we are no longer under the ominous threat of God's judgment. On the cross, Jesus took the punishment that our sins deserve, thereby moving our judgment day from the future to the past. It's no wonder that the same chapter that begins with the, the declaration that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus, that's Romans chapter 8, that that same chapter goes on to explain why the most repeated command in scripture is do not fear. Surrounded by the realities of tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, and sword, Paul nonetheless asserts that if God is for us, none can be against us. And God who gave up his son for us all is surely for us. So how so? surely for us so much so that nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love in Christ. Being in Jesus and not under the law also means we are considered perfect in God's eyes. We have nothing left to prove. We have nothing left to prove. You know, I've said this and I'll say it again. We have a hard time sometimes with that concept because human justice isn't like that. But God has accepted us and loved us and set us free through this sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
And I don't know how you see the necessity of that sacrifice. Was God some harsh judge that had to be satisfied? Or was it more that God knew that we needed that freedom that comes from having Jesus paid the price for us? But we have been set free, and so we are free to love. We have a hard time wrapping our heads sometimes around this concept of the free gift of God. So even though we say it, well, I'm pointing to my head, because even though we understand it intellectually, sometimes in our heart we have trouble accepting that. We have been set free, and it's a gift. It's a gift. And because we have a hard time understanding that, we struggle and struggle and struggle to be acceptable in God's eyes. And that makes us want to take this precious book, the Bible, this precious book that tells us about God's love for us, it makes us want to take it and turn it into a rule book and bash, well, ourselves over the head. But more importantly, the other thing it makes us do is it makes us want to be judgmental. And it makes us want to bash other people over the head. If we can just accept that we are sinners, but are loved by God, then we are free to stop trying to earn God's love. We are free to live in God's love. As Paul says, sisters and brothers, you are not under the law. You are not under the law. Obeying God's law it is not a constraint from the outside that we have to try to follow to fit ourselves or make ourselves right for God, which is a good thing since we can't succeed. But instead, God's law can become a guiding influence, an opportunity to walk in love with God. Reverend Sauls says that the law can become for us like water for a fish. Wrap your head around that image for a minute. That the more that we grow in grace, the more that we turn towards God, when we let go of this concept that I've got to do it all, we can allow ourselves to live in God's grace and love so that the law of God can become for us like water for a fish. As Saul goes on to say, the healthiest, most liberating habitat for you as one created in the image of God. The law, he says, can become a roadmap for growing into the name that you have already been given, as the apostle says in Ephesians, holy and blameless before God. So the free gift of God's grace sets us free from the struggle for acceptance. But, you know, Jesus didn't save us so we could stay just like we are. We are meant to grow, and we are meant to grow towards God. Look at the Gospels and all the teachings Jesus has in there. He, he does tell us to come to him. Come, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I will give you rest. He says that the Son of God came in so that people would have eternal life. But he doesn't stop there. He Look at all of his teachings about how we are to love one another. This is how they will know you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. But I, he, he washes the feet of the apostles and says, do the same thing, even as I be, I'm paraphrasing him. But, you know, he said, you've seen your Lord and master do this. You love one another in the same way. He tells us to love. He, he tells us, he pushes us, go through the, um, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, and see how he adds, he seems to add on to the commandments by requiring a higher standard. Uh, you know, it's not enough just to, to uh, oh, I've lost my train of thought there, so we'll let it go. But Jesus pushes us to be more than what we are, he tells us that we need to surrender our entire self to him and take up a cross and follow him daily. So we are meant not to stand still once we have accepted Jesus, once we have uh, come into his grace. We are meant to continue to grow towards Christian perfection. That's the concept that John Wesley called sanctification. Sanctification. 
And by God's grace, not by on our own, but by God's grace, we can move towards sanctification. But as Reverend Saul uh, puts it about Jesus, he said, when Christ invites us to come to him as we are, he doesn't intend for us to stay as we are. We are meant to grow. Uh, you know, John Wesley has a, a very famous sermon that he wrote called An Altogether Christian. But it's a, it really epitomizes what he tried to teach, that he talks about how we can be what he calls an almost Christian. Now, Wesley didn't mean you weren't a Christian, but what he meant is uh, he was talking about when people don't give their whole heart and soul and mind to God, when they kind of go through the motions of being a Christian, when they don't give all that they are then they're an almost Christian, as he puts it. An altogether Christian is one who gives himself or herself completely to God, who gives, who does what Jesus says, who surrenders himself and and who picks up the cross and follows Jesus. An altogether Christian is one who is growing in love of God and in love of his fellow human beings. It is one who might say a prayer similar to the one that Wesley uses. I had that right before me. And some of you all may have done a a Wesley Covenant service here right at the beginning of the year, at the end. A lot of times they're done, uh, I think it's called Watch Night on December 31st. But listen to the first part of of Wesley's uh, Covenant Prayer. This is what an altogether Christian, uh, this, this is what an altogether Christian desires and longs for, and seeks for. But, you know, you have to think about these words, even when I say them, I have to struggle with it a little bit. There's some parts of it I don't mind, but some parts I'm like, wait a minute now. Here's what Wesley, how Wesley put it. I am no longer my own, but thy. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. So you have to stop right there. Do we really want to be ranked with whomever? (laughs) It's a sacrifice. Put me to doing. Okay, put me to suffering. Ow, a little harder to say. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee. Oh, let me stop right there. Employed for thee or laid aside for thee. Most of us don't mind being employed, but to be laid aside, that's much more difficult. I learned, I'm not saying that I do it all the time, but I did learn that concept when I was working in mission work that sometimes. The real mission becomes not me doing something, but me allowing somebody else to do it, empowering someone else, stepping aside and letting someone else step in instead of me getting all the feel good from that. Let me go back to Wesley. So he says, put me to what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt, put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. That's the kind of Christian that's an altogether Christian, one that can say and then truly try to mean the words in this prayer. But, you know, recognizing that we're meant to grow in grace, and we are meant to grow in grace doesn't mean that we need to torture ourselves with guilt and shame. Just as we don't have to torture ourselves with guilt and shame and think, oh, I can never measure up to Jesus Christ, because you can't. We can accept what Jesus has done for us, and we can, we can have that freedom of being set free to love. And likewise, we can strive to move towards perfection, do all that we can, in terms of prayer and Bible study and listening for the will of God and directing our feet towards the will of God without getting all wrapped up in a bunch of shame. We are meant to grow, but we need to do what Reverend Saul says. We need to trust what Paul says in Philippians. Here's Paul in Philippians. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He began a good work in you. God did. 
and he began a good work in you, and he's going to complete it. So our job is to participate in that completing. We're going to stumble. We're going to backslide. But we keep on working. We keep on praying. We keep on striving to, to become that fish in water, as it were, in God's law to move towards perfection. God is going to complete a good work in us. Jesus calls us to be, he calls us to be like him, to be a servant like he was and to love like he did. And the more we grow in Christian love, the more full and fulfilled, I can't say that word, the more full and fulfilled we feel the more irresistible Christians we become. You see, because I think that as we love and as we work towards love and as we grow in love and as we empty ourselves in love, we become exactly what God created us. We are made in God's image. God is love. And we are meant to be love. And so, we are, and so we strive to move towards Christian perfection or sanctification, as John Wesley calls it. And as I said, the more we grow in Christian love, the more fulfilled we are, and the more we become this irresistible Christian that Reverend Scott Sauls talks about. And we begin this movement, this growth, by abiding in Christ. Now, I told you last week that that would be the subject of the next lesson. So now I'm promising you that next week, which will be what, January the 22nd will be the day that this starts, we will begin talking about how do we abide in Jesus. My friends, I hope you have a very blessed week. Go forth knowing that you are loved by God. Bye-bye now.